So, welcome to class 12 of uh, topics in power electronics and distributed generation. In the last class, we were talking about uh, grounding of distribution systems and uh, we saw that uh, in the example that we were discussing in class that uh, there is a, a possibility where you might have an upstream breaker in your circuit uh, opening when a DG is uh, uh, when a downstream DG is still connected to the system and there is a possibility that uh, this connected DG may operate and continue to excite the, the feeder even when a uh, upstream uh, breaker has opened. And uh, this particular situation of uh, uh, a upstream device opening and the rest of your distribution system uh, operating uh, uh, being excited is called a unintentional island, where for some unintentional reason an upstream uh, breaker opened, but the DG if it can actually uh, uh, stay connected and provide power to the loads on the system, it will continue to actually excite uh, the feeder and we will see that uh, islanding is an important issue when we look at distributed generation. So, when we talk about islands in a distribution network, uh, in geography an island is a, a land body which is uh, uh, disconnected from the mainland separated by water. So, if you look at a electrical uh, system, uh, electrical island is essentially a small part of the distribution net electrical network in the distribution system. and this is the smaller network is disconnected from the main grid uh, due to a open circuit. Okay. And a typical cause of the open circuit might be a upstream breaker opening or a fuses blowing, uh, it can be just the wire physically breaking. So, there can be a variety of reasons why you might result in an island commonly common situation would be a breaker opening. Okay. And uh, uh, electrical uh, uh, islanding uh, uh, situation it can be of two varieties. One is you have an intentional island or you can have an unintentional island. Okay. So, if you look at uh, uh, intentional island, uh, the reason why uh, one would uh, typically uh, have an intentional island is for a reason of power quality. Okay. And the idea is you open say a breaker uh, uh, which connects to the main grids and then your source can actually feed a local load when there is a poor power quality in the main grid. Okay. So, you want to isolate yourself from the main grid and uh, continue to feed higher quality uh, power to your load in a dedicated manner. So, so, there might be reasons why you intentionally operate as an island. So, the question comes what do you mean by power quality or it is more often measured uh, by what do you mean by power quality being poor uh, as seen by the load. Okay. So, a load seeing poor power quality from the supply 
can be for a variety of reasons. The uh, primary reason being that there is no supply at all, there is an outage and you want to actually feed your load. So, that is a primary reason. Okay. Uh, if you have, if you are having electric supply, you expect your voltage, uh, line to neutral voltage to be uh, 230 volts, some nominal voltage. Uh, typically, a band around the nominal might be acceptable. You might have your voltage, uh, say uh, plus 10, minus uh, 20 percent band around nominal might be considered acceptable power quality. If you go beyond that, you may want to disconnect uh, rapidly. Uh, you might have say uh, uh, voltage imbalance. I mean your voltages might be close to nominal, but uh, your uh, phases may not have equal amplitude voltage or there may be some phase shifts. Uh, it depends on the type of load. I mean say for example, if you are feeding single phase loads, then the imbalance may not be a major thing, but if you are feeding say induction machine load, then uh, even uh, imbalance of uh, 3, 3 percent would be considered uh, unacceptable. Okay. I mean you can see why uh, say 3 percent might be considered unacceptable. A typical induction machine has uh, leakage inductance in the range of say 15 to 20 percent. So, a 15 to 20 percent imbalance would mean that uh, even at no load, your current drawn, uh, imbalanced current drawn would correspond to almost full load uh, when there is a 15 percent imbalance. So, if you are having something like a, a 3 percent imbalance, it means that you are having 20 percent of your current coming in because of your imbalance. So, you might have a service factor of 20 percent on your machine. So, that may be the maximum that you can tolerate on a continue, continued basis. So, your imbalance percentage is typically much tighter than what is your acceptable voltage amplitude. Also your frequency might be outside what is your acceptable range. I mean depending on what is the process that you are trying to do. You may be trying to do some speed control, there may be some machines which are susceptible for mechanical resonances. Say if you are having something like a computer power supply, it might be able to accept a wider range of uh, uh, frequencies, but if you have fans, mechanical loads, you might need a tighter range of frequencies. Say locally, we might uh, uh, say 48 hertz to uh, 50.5 hertz might be considered as something which might be acceptable if you go outside that range you might want to disconnect uh, again depending on your load, you know, what is expected uh, at the load okay. and your nominal frequency is 50 hertz. Uh, another thing that uh, you might say would uh, be a situation of poor power quality is when you have uh, uh, harmonics in your load, you have distorted waveforms. Uh, people measure harmonics in waveforms in terms of uh, uh, total harmonic distortion. So, uh, acceptable THD level for your voltage might be uh, less than 2 percent. So, you want to make sure that uh, your uh, voltage that is being supplied to you is not uh, very highly distorted. Okay. Again, it depends on how sensitive your load is. You might have, have some tighter requirement for very sensitive type of load. Uh, you can have transient effects uh, uh, which would also affect power quality. Uh, an example is a short term duration of uh, voltage amplitude increasing or a short duration where the voltage dips. Uh, this is a sag or a swell. You might have notches in the waveforms if you have uh, equipment such as thyristor power converters connected to your point of common coupling. You can have flicker in your load uh, if say someone is operating a, a electric arc welder uh, in your uh, same street as where you are living, then chances are you will see a lot of flicker in your uh, voltage that. Uh, so, you can see that as lights that are uh, glowing brightly and then it becomes dim again glowing brightly. Some people are ex extremely sensitive to 
variation of uh, light intensity. So, for, for many of these power quality reasons you might want to intentionally disconnect from the grid and uh, open a breaker and then feed your local load from a DG. So, that uh, when the power quality is poor you have your uh, critical load being fed from your DG when the grid power quality comes back to an acceptable range you would then close the circuit breaker and operate in a normal condition. And the common systems that uh, use such a property are uh, UPS systems, gensets, uh, they all operate in this particular manner where uh, you are addressing poor power quality by adding such uh, components. Uh, you can also have a situation where uh, uh, the power, uh, to address power quality it may not be just the uh, your own facility breaker that you open you might for some reason uh, be capable of opening uh, a breaker at the network and providing poor power uh, improved power quality uh, on the feeder itself it depends on whether your distributed generator set has the capability to provide that level of uh, power both real and reactive also whether it can operate stably with uh, such a big network uh, wider uh, network uh, you could also have other uh, technical uh, conditions which may be need to be satisfied is this dg capable of clearing faults in your neighboring uh, load uh, there may be non technical issues such as uh, what is the economic benefit of uh, providing power to your neighbor or uh, there may be legal questions like uh, who owns different aspects of the system the, the, the utility might own the lines the uh, one entity might own the DG another entity would own the next load. So, there are a number of uh, issues to be addressed where if you are trying to operate in as a intentional island on a broader sense and people refer to such uh, situations as uh, uh, microgrid at the distribution level not microgrid at within a small facility, but microgrid at the distribution level. Okay. So, if you look at then the other situation where you can have an island. So, what we discussed so far was when you have an intentional island you can also have the situation where you have a uh, unintentional island and uh, the unintentional island as we just saw in the example that we discussed uh, it is not because you intended to actually open a upstream breaker, but it opened for a variety of reasons and uh, for some unintentional reason now your DG is uh, exciting the, the feeder. Okay, the the common network the, the, the feeder network and uh, it can lead to a, a variety of problems. Okay. Uh, and we will uh, and even for forming an unintentional uh, island you have requirement that the DG that you have should be capable of uh, providing the power for your neighboring loads. Okay. So, if your um, load total load on the feeder is of the order of megawatt and your DG is 1 kilowatt obviously, it cannot form a island. So, you are talking about capability of uh, your DG and your load to be similar uh, both in terms of real and reactive power okay, requirement being able to match that. And for the unintentional island to be operated in a sustained manner you need to have a stable operating point of the DG and the load. Okay. So, so the, there are a variety of reasons why uh, unintentional island is uh, not desirable and uh, the primary uh, reason is uh, safety concern. Okay. Uh, typically when you open an upstream breaker in a distribution system the assumption is whatever downstream of it is uh, de-energized which means it is potentially safe to go and touch. Whereas, now you have a DG system you open an upstream breaker now potentially the downstream system is still energized. So, if a person uh, a lineman goes to repair the downstream system 
he can potentially get a uh, shock, uh, he can get electrocuted. So, safety is a major concern. Okay. So, So, you can address this issue in a variety of ways, you can try to have a live line type of rep repair, when you go to larger transmission systems, you can do repair of the transmission system components without de-energizing the line, using people in Faraday cages etcetera, but that makes it a more complicated operation, it is more expensive. Uh, so, uh, safety is a big concern when you are having uh, possibility of a DG source uh, forming an unintentional island. Okay. Uh, also, you can damage the utility equipment uh, in an unintentional island and we saw that uh, the faults may not clear, the capability of uh, the DG to provide fault current to uh, trigger a protective device might be lesser than the main grid. So, uh, So, you might have the change in uh, protective coordination settings as we saw in our example. Uh, you can have sectionalizers that uh, open under load. Uh, you also have uh, the possibility of uh, what people refer to as ferro resonance. So, on a distribution feeder you would have uh, capacitors um, could be for power factor correction and then when you are connected with the grid, you have those capacitors and your magnetizing branches of your transformers etcetera, which are connected in parallel to a stiff grid, which prevents your voltage from uh, going uh, to be uh, different from your nominal value. And when you connect a DG source, which might have a much higher impedance and you disconnect the voltage source, the chances of resonances could be high. So, the resonance between your magnetizing branch and capacitances may be power factor ca correction capacitors or it can be capacitances of cables uh, can actually lead to ferro resonance and you can see highly distorted waveforms uh, with uh, sharp peaks and that can damage uh, utility equipment. Okay. You can also damage the, the distributed generation source itself. Uh, because you can have uh, overloading. Uh, because you are trying to carry a, a wider set of loads uh, of the entire feeder, your frequencies might drift outside nominal values. Uh, also, you have something that is uh, a possibility is that. Uh, is uh, out of phase reclosing. And we will see that uh, out of phase reclosing is actually an important issue when uh, we consider uh, 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 a situation of uh, damage, it can actually damage the DG, it can damage other cons uh, customer equipment, it can also damage uh, utility equipment. And uh, su such a situation can arise where say you have a, a up upstream recloser and we look at an example where uh, say the upstream recloser uh, uh, has uh, off duration of say 5 seconds. So, we will look at an example where your grid frequency is 50 hertz. And uh, your, you assume that uh, after the recloser opened, then the loads with your uh, DG 
for in the island the frequency shifted to some other value say the dg the system frequency shifted to f of the island shifted to say 49.9 uh, hertz uh, after uh, disconnection of the main breaker and the recloser say stayed open for 5 seconds and then it tries to reclose. Okay. So, we will look at what would be the phase of the voltage on the grid side and the phase of the voltage on the island uh, when the recloser is reclosing and to determine the phase of the voltage you have you know your delta f. Uh, is 0.1 hertz and then you look at what is the phase shift that occurred in this duration your delta f, uh, shift in phase is delta f into t off into 360 degrees. So, this is uh, 0.1 into 5 into 360. So, this is 180 degrees. So, you can see that this, this, the waveform would be a sine wave like this over here, it could be it will have the op opposite polarity. So, when the recloser closes, it is trying to introducing a, a abrupt 180 degree phase shift in the voltage that is now getting applied to the system. So, you can see that uh, in any electrical system, uh, even a nominal direct online start will cause a large inrush. Now, you are having a star uh, almost like a 180 degree phase shift, your currents that can flow in such a situation is much higher than a normal uh, say direct online start and you can have severe uh, repercussions. You can if this is a synchronous machine type of uh, then you, may, you could potentially damage the, the, the DG source if there are fuses on the distribution system the current that it might draw might be large enough to damage uh, open the fuses. Uh, and uh, what we will see is that if you have a neighboring uh, load uh, when the voltage over here drifted for 5 seconds and became out of phase then essentially the, the phase of your uh, flux vector in your machine is also following that particular voltage in the island. So, now you have now a induction machine where it is uh, 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 induced magnetic field is in one polarity and the voltage that is now being applied from the grid is 180 is trying to create a magnetic field 180 degrees uh, out of phase. So, the, the current that flows into this in rush machine uh, in rush into the machine can be as high as uh, twice your uh, current that you would see in di direct online start or even higher because of saturation effects. So, you can possibly have things like 10 per unit uh, peak torque that you would see on the shaft of the machine potentially you can actually damage the shaft, the shaft can actually crack open. So, there can be extensive damage now not just for the DG, but for all loads that are connected on the feeder. So, you can see that uh, this is uh, a very important consideration uh, when you have a DG system. Uh, so, the, uh, the uh, other customers And if you are applying a step voltage of twice the peak value, you can have resonances with uh, uh, capacity capacitances on the line. You can get resonant over voltages that go up to 4 per unit. So, that is really high over voltage. Uh, and if you end up damaging uh, the neighbor's uh, electrical equipment, then there is a big question of uh, who is liable. Okay. So, 
So, if you look at a typical electrical system, uh, the cost of all the equipment that is connected to the electrical system, you might have very expensive process equipment, uh, you go to uh, uh, data centers, you might have lots of expensive computers. So, the connected loads would have much higher value than the original electrical system which is actually providing the energy feed and if you end up damaging uh, all the loads, then there is a severe uh, liability issue and typically your uh, electricity service provider uh, takes insurance that uh, they would cover in case they provide extremely poor service that uh, your equipment is damaged, they are liable to actually pay you for the damage that they have caused. So, now if uh, DG is doing this, then the question is who is responsible? Is it the DG owner? Is it the uh, service provider uh, or should the customers themselves be uh, taking the liability. So, uh, the issue of uh, how to deal with uh, electrical island, uh, especially the unintentional island is uh, important concern in uh, DG systems. So, if you look at uh, the example that we saw over here. Uh, here we looked at uh, a recloser where your T off was uh, is 5 seconds and uh, the amount of uh, uh, duration that uh, your T off can have can vary. I mean you can have fast reclosing, you might have slow reclosing and uh, people consider 2 seconds to be a reasonably fast reclosing. So, uh, if you look at uh, standards such as IEEE 1547. Uh, it says that uh, distributed generation source should uh, disconnect before 2 seconds after opening of a upstream device and the, the uh, reason is that before the upstream device recloses, you need to be able to detect that something upstream has opened and de-energize the DG so that uh, you do not have uh, possibilities of uh, out of phase reclosing. Okay. So, uh, minimum T off. So, you need to detect uh, a situation of an unintentional island in a fairly short time frame. Uh, you cannot use algorithms which might take uh, tens of seconds or minutes. You need to be able to detect that something like this has happened uh, in a second or two okay, or faster, faster. So, if you uh, want to detect a situation of an un unintentional island, people have uh, employed methods, people call it uh, anti-islanding algorithm, uh, essentially what detects a situation that there has been an unintentional island and the types of anti-islanding uh, detection methods uh, can be thought of as uh, being passive or it can be active or it can involve uh, signaling or communication. Okay. When you look at passive methods for anti-islanding, what you are essentially doing is you are measuring your voltage and current at the terminals of your DG uh, device and uh, or at the interconnection point of inter interconnection with your main grid. Uh, you are measuring it through uh, uh, potential transformers CTs into some protective relay and uh, you decide on whether to open or keep the interconnection breaker, you decide on whether to keep it open or closed based on the decision of the algorithm. Okay. Uh, 
and it typically does not uh, directly interact with your uh, DG controls. And uh, that is one of the reason why it is uh, uh, called passive because it does not actively try to shift the control action. And uh, the passive methods are not always 100 percent effective if it is especially if it is uh, based on pure voltage measurements. And uh, or you might have restrictions on how the DG is operated, uh, which will prevent uh, and how the loading is being done in the facility. So, there might be restrictions on operation. Okay. And uh, if you are looking at the voltage, essentially uh, pure voltage based methods might be you might be looking at uh, if the voltage uh, goes too high or too low, then potentially there might be a islanding situation or you might be looking at uh, under or over frequency uh, or you might uh, be looking at the direction of power flow. Uh, so, we will look at uh, some of these. Uh, methods of uh, passive and anti islanding. Uh, before that, we will also discuss some of uh, what uh, would constitute uh, active and anti islanding method. So, this is based on uh, adjusting the distributed generation, uh, generation uh, source uh, operation based on your actual measurements. Okay. And uh, the idea in this particular case is that uh, uh, you destabilize the island so that the operating point that you get when you disconnect the, the uh, an upstream uh, device would not be stable. And because your operating point is not stable, it means that your your voltage amplitude or your frequency would go outside. It would. Uh, go outside what would be a nominal uh, range and the fact that your voltage or frequency went outside the nominal range would be used to actually open your interconnection uh, device. Okay. And uh, if you look at the method of uh, active anti islanding, it makes use of measurements, it use, uh, makes use of active controls. So, its reliability uh, would 
be a little bit uh, less compared to the passive method. Ideally, if a passive method can operate reliably, that would be the, uh, the a better method uh, because uh, active method is now using not just your detection, but also now active controls. So, you could think of it as being slightly less reliable, but the chances of detecting an island might be more in the active method. Okay. The, the third uh, method is uh, communication based methods or signaling based methods. In uh, the traditional transmission systems, people have used pilot relays to transfer information from one point to the another point to make better uh, decisions. So, you could use uh, information may, may be from the substation to the DG to inform whether a substation breaker is open or whether uh, some feeder need to be de-energized. So, you could uh, make use of uh, explicit signaling or communication. And uh, in this case, now you need an additional channel uh, uh, rather than just the power lines, you need now com a communication channel to be also available. So, the cost can potentially be higher when you want uh, such uh, systems to work. Also, reliability of the communication channel may not be as high as uh, the underlying electrical network. So, you have uh, reliability concerns. Uh, to address some of the cost issues, people have looked at uh, methods like uh, power line carrier communication methods to see whether the power line itself could also carry this information on the status. Uh, so, people have looked at a variety of uh, such uh, methods to see whether you could have uh, explicit signaling based methods that can be effective, but again in this particular uh, case. Uh, reliability is a concern because in this case you have uh, coordination between multiple agencies for some algorithm to work. The, you have to have coordination from your utility which is sending the information then coordination at the DG side which is taking that information and using it to open a breaker. So, that becomes more uh, complex a problem rather than one entity making the decision by itself in a reliable manner. Okay. So, uh, we, uh, we just mentioned that uh, the effectiveness of an anti-islanding algorithm, uh, it may not be effective at all times, uh, especially in the context of a passive uh, method and uh, you might have a range of values where uh, the method may not uh, uh, work well. Uh, for a range of parameters or a range of system values where the islanding method may not function in an effective manner and the range of uh, region where the uh, region of the parameter space where the islanding detection may not be effective uh, is called a non-detection zone. Okay. So, a non-detection zone.
and uh, the objective of a good anti aligning algorithm is to make the size of this non detection zone uh, to be 0. So, the ideally it should be 0 which means that it would be a very good uh, anti aligning algorithm. So, what we will do next is to look at uh, a model uh, of your feeder with your distributed generation source. So, as to uh, uh, look at uh, the situation of uh, passive uh, uh, I'll, uh, passive uh, uh, anti aligning detection on that feeder. Okay. So, so we will uh, look at what it means for this uh, simplified uh, description of the feeder. So, what you have over here is the upstream grid uh, modeled as a voltage source. This is uh, essentially what comes from your substation and you might have a breaker upstream breaker modeled as the switch S1 which can open. Okay. Uh, all the loads on the feeder are modeled as uh, it is modeled as a RLC a parallel RLC load. Uh, typically, you might have your real power consumed by your R load, reactive power being drawn by uh, L, your transformers, um, com whatever components, machines etcetera and you might have power factor correction capacitors etcetera on your feeder. So, you could think of your overall load to consist of a RLC uh, equivalent network and you can model your distributed generation source as uh, uh, something that injects uh, uh, power and reactive power and we will assume that uh, the reactive power that is injecting is uh, uh, under is 0, it is operating under unity power factor trying to inject power at unity power factor at its uh, point of common coupling. And uh, we will look at a situation where uh, the, the amount of power that is being drawn by the load matches well with the power that is being supplied by the DG. Uh, if the Q reactive power from the DG is uh, uh, 0, it means that uh, the balance reactive power is the difference between the reactive power drawn by L and C and if the feeder is well compensated it means that your Q of uh, the load uh, would be almost 0. Okay. So, if there is any difference between what is being drawn by the load and what is being supplied by the DG that is essentially delta P and delta Q coming in from your uh, main source which is your main grid. So, the problem can be simplified as when the switch is closed your main grid sets your voltage and frequency seen uh, by your RLC load. Then when the switch S1 opens uh, there might be some deviation in the voltage and frequency uh, seen at this particular load and uh, can you operate switch S2 which is downstream by looking at this voltage and frequency can you operate the switch S2 to actually disconnect the DG in response to the changed value of voltage and frequency. Okay. So, that is essentially the anti aligning problem if S1 opens under what conditions can the anti aligning algorithm determine the situation this that such a situation has occurred and it needs to open S2 as a result. So, uh, 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 so, the other assumptions over here that the DG is capable of providing power uh, that whatever power is being drawn by, the, uh, by uh, your load. The other thing is that because your uh, DG is providing power at unity power factor then the assumption is you have very good reactive power compensation. Okay. So, the feeder is well compensated. So, if uh, so if you look at the first uh, uh, situation you have uh, if uh, V square by R 
is your load power. So, this implies that your delta p is p of the load minus p of your d g is 0. So, the second situation is if uh, your uh, feeder is well compensated at uh, 50 hertz, then your omega is which is 1 by uh, root L c uh, would turn out to be uh, 2 pi times 50. Uh, so, if you have a parallel resonance circuit, if your uh, resonance frequency is 50 hertz in a parallel resonance circuit, whatever you draw would be uh, uh, in phase if there is a, a resistive load or it would not draw any current if there is no resistance load, which means that your reactive wire of your capacitor is exactly balanced by the wars of your inductor. Okay. So, your Q L is uh, Q L of your inductor is uh, and you can calculate both of this would turn out to be equal to V square divided by uh, square root of L by C. So, if you look at your delta Q that is being drawn from your uh, source, this is equal to Q of your load minus Q of your d g and Q d g is 0 and Q L is equal to Q C. So, this is equal to 0. So, essentially if you look at conditions 1 and 2, what you are going to have in uh, uh, the ideal situation is that you are going to have sustained L C oscillations uh, even after opening the uh, circuit breaker. Okay. So, the third aspect that we will look at is what is the quali quality factor of this resonance. and your resonant frequency is 1 by square root of L c. So, uh, it turns out that uh, your Q f is r divided by root of L by c and uh, you also know that omega is 1 by root L c. So, you can substitute for this you will see that essentially Q f is equal to Q of your inductor divided by your p load is equal to q of your capacitor divided by. So, in a situation where uh, if q f is high then 
what this implies is your p load is less than your q of your inductor or q of your capacitor. It means that your, your system response is going to be dominated by your, uh, your LC uh, oscillations and your loading some even if there is some level of loading mismatch your exponential term which is essentially your damping term may not, may not be the dominant term in your overall response uh, in the time frame required in your analysis. So, So, for your the anti-aliening test what we look at is a situation where uh, q f uh, is greater than or equal to 1 and essentially what uh, you are uh, looking at is uh, uh, if under in the ideal condition if uh, you are opening the switch and your uh, your delta p and delta q is uh, close to 0 what it means is that uh, uh, after opening the switch there is almost uh, delta p and delta q is 0 it means that the current flowing through the switch is 0 and opening the switch will not cause any disturbance your v and f will continue to be where it originally was which means that uh, any method that was that is me measuring your voltage and frequency to open uh, the circuit breaker of the DG would not be effective. So, having small values of delta p and delta q it would mean that uh, method with pure voltage uh, or uh, frequency measurement would not work. So, you need to have some a mismatch in your delta p and delta q for just pure voltage based methods to work. Uh, in our next discussion on aliening what we will do is try to look, uh, look at the threshold of your voltage and the threshold of your frequency and look at how that relates to how much delta p is there, how much delta q is there uh, to look at what is the relationship between uh, essentially you can think of delta p and delta q to be aspects of your uh, non detection zone which is which can again be reflected in terms of what your r l and c parameters are and relating that to the dg and we'll try to see how that can be used to set voltage and frequency thresholds to determine uh, a situation of an unintentional island in a passive manner okay knowing well enough that it would not be 100 percent effective uh, in a situation where you have a feeder where your uh, feeder load is 1 megawatt and your DG is also providing 1 megawatt there is a pot, uh, po potential that such a method may not work. But if you you would be able to say if your now feeder is 1 megawatt can I introduce up to half a megawatt of DG and still be able to detect a uh, unintentional island. Okay. So, you could ask questions like that with uh, such an analysis. Thank you.